You can? Okay. We're going to try to be mindful today. We had those fancy mics at MCC, and now uh, we're back to our regular mics, so I'm going to make sure <laughs> that I'm leaning in, um, and we'll try to remember. If anybody can't hear, please raise your hand, and we'll make sure that folks stay on the mics. We'll call the meeting to order. First up, I'll read the legal notice. As information from our audience, if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Metropolitan Board of Fair Commissioners today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the board's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact your own independent legal counsel. All right, so now we're going to look at our minutes from the previous meeting, which were distributed to the board. If anyone has a motion, let me know. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second it if I can turn it on. <laughs> second. Excellent. All in favor? Or do we have a discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Now we'll move on to public comment time. Uh, as a reminder, we have 15 minutes total, and everyone has two minutes to speak. If anyone would like to make a comment. Good morning, thank you. My name is Heidi Baskell Favorite. I live at 1711 Neal Terrace. I am mad at the city. I've sent a few of you some critical emails, but I'm not mad at y'all. I'm grateful for the effort that you are having to put forth to deal with this idiotic proposal. So I've reviewed the sound study and I have a lot of questions. I'd actually like to know if there could be a private study conducted by the fairgrounds. Where is the data that shows 50% reduction? It seems like fancy math. Oh, mufflers that you were supposed to be using for the past decade. Oh, we're going to reduce races by five practices annually. But oh, guess what? For NASCAR events that we fold in, no mufflers, no curfews. I'd like to see the data. I want to be convinced. If you could tell me that something like this could come into a neighborhood and have a 50% reduction in sound, it'd be beautiful. Maybe we wouldn't have half of the issues we have with this proposal, but I simply don't trust it. Um, as far as using, this is a metal building. This was listed as sound mitigation. A 20 foot wall, residential homes as sound mitigation. This clearly shows that this company may be very, very professional and skilled at what they do, but they don't understand what putting a racetrack with 130 decibels in the middle of a city actually means. This kind of sound can't be held back. We have an audiologist on, on the board comparing 75 decibels of human interaction to something that literally moves sound is not the same thing. I've seen some things where it says, well, it's at 75% on the decibel, uh, on the sound scale. That's equivalent to a busy office. This sound, and I have videos that show it, it moves molecule, like you, you it, it's not the human voice. So this is, this is a joke, and I'd like to see the data that has, that's actually legit. As far as, so there's a race this weekend. I always have an open invitation. You can come have tea. I'll, I'll serve you a cocktail so that you could experience the race for yourself. Even a few cars, you will understand how loud it is. Finally, every time we ask Bristol Motor Speedway, and I know I'm trying to be quick, every time we ask them, a, you know, 
Talk to us about the fiscal responsibility of this plan. What happens when the ticket tax sales no longer cover the giant bill that this is going to cost? Talk to us about how this plan fits in with the city's plan for um, carbon emissions reductions. Talk about the elementary school 900 feet away. Talk about parking, talk about transportation, and at every corner, Bristol Motor Speedway punts back to the city. So I will ask, and I will leave you with this, why doesn't the city continue with the original plan, which was to fund, update this track, allow for management of this track to stay within the fair board so that, they, so that you all, over time, can make adjustments for what is good for our city. Indebting us to a 30-year plan that is undoubtedly not good for our city is the wrong way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> Any other public comments? Okay, then we will move on to the financial report. Mrs. Allen. Good morning, everyone. You may have to pick up your... Good morning, everyone. The financial information presented today is preliminary and our revenue and expenses for June 2021 may not have been The financial information presented today is preliminary and all revenue and expenses for June 2021 may not have been recorded to the ledgers as of July 12, 2021, when this report was created. The preliminary actuals through June 2021 are as follows. The revenue through June 2021 is $469,817. Our Metro subsidy through June 2021 is two million three hundred and twenty one dollars two million three hundred and twenty one thousand one hundred dollars expenditures around two million two hundred and fifty two thousand eight hundred and forty one dollars resulting in a net gain of approximately five hundred and thirty eight thousand seventy six dollars depreciation expense is one million one hundred and eighty five thousand four hundred and eighty one dollars so the total net loss is roughly six hundred and forty seven thousand four hundred dollars below you will find an itemized list of our expenditures our top three expenses are payroll utilities insurance and low cap payroll expenses approximately one million one hundred and forty five thousand two hundred and fifty four dollars which represents 51 percent of our total expenses utilities expense is four hundred and fifty two thousand eight hundred and forty dollars which is twenty percent Insurance permits and low cap expense is $390,842, which represents 17% of our total expenses. At this point, we have expensed 72% 72, 72 of our total budget. Now that the FY22 budget has been approved by council, our FY22 budget has increased to $3,173,700, which is an increase of $52,300 or 1.68 percent we will start our true up process this month which is an exercise to reallocate resources to between line items we will submit that information to finance by july 29th this concludes the financial report are there any questions Okay, good, okay, then we'll move on to, thank you for that, we'll move on to the Executive Director's Report. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think I probably share everyone's um, joy that we're back here at the fairgrounds for a board meeting. It's been a long time. It's been since March, um, year and a, almost a year and a half ago. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be back and it's nice to, to see everyone. So thank you for coming. Um, most of my comments I'm gonna reserve for the individual um, agenda items, but I will make mention since we are here in the expos, um, we are progressing with uh, cleaning and repairs. So we are cleaned and sanitized in, in this building and in Expo 3. Um, as you can see, we've got a lot of tables and supplies and such that we're just organizing and inventorying 
um, since we have a little bit of downtime. Expo One is still in process of um, doing some final cleaning as well as we've got some repairs to do in that building um, with some sewer work by the bathrooms. And so we are still anticipating a September 1st opening date. We'll be able to open these buildings early, which I know um, Mr. Wallace is very happy about. We've got some indoor events that are scheduled for early August. Um, so, you know, we're going to be starting those events in these two buildings uh, coming up. We're going to remain an outdoor only flea market through August. Uh, it, it's pretty difficult to uh, kind of pick and choose if we're not able to open the full building for the flea market. It, it makes sense to continue to be outside. We're averaging, you know, 100 to 110 vendors. Um, 250 to 300 booths so we are still at a portion of our capacity there but I will say it's been really hot <laughs> generally our summer months are not our really busy months for flea but I will say that our customer traffic has been really encouraging everybody is really looking forward to getting back and I know that a lot of our indoor vendors have shown um, some excitement knowing that we're going to be open fully in September. So we're looking forward to that. Any questions for Laura? Thank you, Laura. And I echo the excitement to be back here for sure. Thank you for th thanks to the staff and everybody that put this together and got us back in here. Um, now we will move on to old business to the BMS update. I know we have Mr. Weaver here. I see Mr. Phillips is here from Metro and uh, Tom Cross as well. So, um, and then we're going to hear, um, I feel very lucky, we're going to hear from uh, Commissioner Weiner on the sound study as well. So Mr. Weaver, Mr. Phillips, whoever. Good morning. Is this on? Um, Maybe get a little closer. Let's see. Good morning. Yes. <laughs> wow. But I'll turn anything over. Thank you guys for. Um, uh, having us this morning, I'm James Weaver with Waller here on behalf of Bristol. James, I'm sorry, can you, you're, you're going to have to, like, kiss the mic. <laughs> <laughs> no more pandemic, right, so I can get really close to the mic. Um, James Weaver, Waller, Lanston here this morning for Bristol. Thank you guys uh, for all you do. Congratulations on, uh, on your space. The first time I've been in here, it's fabulous. Um, um, Quickly, um, I'm a poor substitute for Mr. Caldwell, but I'll run through just sort of our um, monthly report. We continue to have good meetings with the city, including uh, a meeting um, uh, last week with the negotiating, the city's negotiating team and Laura and your chair. We continue to plow through the various issues associated with the lease and operating agreement and the um, uh, development agreement. And we're currently waiting for some decisions with, from the city uh, with regard to financing and other things before we hopefully can start putting a finishing touches on things but we feel good about the progress that we've made thus far and appreciate the chair and Laura's continue to work with us as we as we work on uh, these various agreements uh, our community conversations continue our team has conducted 24 virtual and in-person meetings with various neighborhood groups and organizations in every direction around the fairgrounds to talk about the city's vision to restore the speedway to prominence and to create a year-round multi-purpose facility for the community. We believe that this is an unprecedented level of community engagement that has provided us with valuable feedback and continues to provide us with valuable feedback and has shaped and will continue to shape our plans for a state-of-the-art sound mitigation that will cut the race waste uh, sound by half and start new partnerships that will be enriching neighborhoods around the, the track in our neighborhood schools and nonprofits around the track. To that end, we have done two email surveys, 5,000 uh, emails each, both of which have asked for and we have received feedback from uh, the folks that we sent those surveys to. We've done two 15,000 piece mail pieces in and around the track one of which providing access to the sound study, the other asking for, asking for feedback, providing telephone numbers and email addresses for folks to provide us feedback. And we uh, have received a great amount of input from both of those um, mail pieces. As I mentioned, we've done 24 community meetings. We've got three left to do. 
Uh, we've started our outreach and meetings with the school system. We're doing that outreach in conjunction with the school system and with Bransford Avenue. Well, we've started that with the schools that are closest to the track and we're now expanding that out into the neighborhood. Finally, and in, uh, we are in the final stages of completing our community benefits strategy that will be presented to the board along with a, uh, a lease and uh, a development agreement. Um, we're in the final stages of that. Um, our community benefits strategy is multi-organizational. It uh, includes um, several different nonprofit organizations in and around this part of the city. Um, it's neighborhood centric and will be neighborhood centric. It's diverse and it's inclusive. We're very excited about our community benefits strategy. We look forward to presenting this to that to you guys along with a uh, along with the contract and we'll certainly have our nonprofit partners our multiple nonprofit partners with us for that presentation and with that madam chair that's our report any questions for mr. Weaver just a couple questions uh, mr. Weaver you said 24 is the number of community meetings now I'm a little confused um, because uh, I haven't I haven't heard about any of those being scheduled recently and and you know I'd even emailed with Matthew Kuhn in in June and and uh, he'd said those were sort of on hold. So have there been more since then or? We've done 24 community meetings. Have you done any since June? I don't know. Okay. We've done 24. Okay, just want to make sure I'm getting invited to those because I've sat in on many and I follow up with neighbors and get feedback. So I would like I'll, to get- I'll pass that along. I'm, I'm not in charge of the invites, but I'll make sure they, they keep you You've been on the list. I would assume you're still okay. on the list. Thanks. We've done 24 meetings. Thanks. Not 25, um, not 23. 24. 24. Thanks. Um, and uh, uh, we, with the community benefit strategy, just, just my feedback again, and I know you've heard it many times, I, I'm looking for Stand Up Nashville's involvement in that. And I'm looking for covenants to Stand Up Nashville that your activities will not undermine the very important existing community benefits agreement. And so uh, that's a really important, we're seeing important work. We're gonna talk about it later, about what's happening with that community benefits agreement. And, and I am looking for Bristol to make covenants to stand up Nashville. So there is a direct connection there to ensure that whatever Bristol is gonna propose when we actually have a specific plan, which we don't have yet, isn't going to undermine that the, uh, the benefits provided there. That's, I see two issues um, associated with your statement. The, the first one, um, obviously, the work that we hope to do associated with the track. Um, James, I'm so sorry. Can you lean in a little bit? Thank you. I know. Obviously, I'm getting hands raised behind you. I'm sorry. The work that we do associated with the track uh, cannot adversely impact anything that's going on on this campus, whether it's this building, whether it's MLS, whether it's flea market, we have to, we, we have to work together. Stand Up's agreement with MLS is um, uh, part and parcel of being on this facility. No problem. I'm reasonably sure that the board can't demand who I work with. I'm pretty sure it's illegal. Um, I'll leave that to your legal counsel. But these community benefit understandings are private agreements between two private entities and governments not involved. That's right. And so uh, we are working with multiple nonprofit entities in and around this part of Nashville. Those will be presented and the board can take those into consideration or not take those into consideration. But they're not part and parcel of the formal agreements between us and the city because that'd be illegal. Thanks for the, thanks for that. Thanks for the insight. And I, I, don't, I don't need that. I don't need that warning or, or just, or, or sort of shot across the bow there. But, but I, what I said as I'm looking for is evidence that you've talked to stand up Nashville and, and that just like, just like with the soccer agreement, we, the, the, the council and the fair board looked for that evidence before it, it moved forward. And so I'm looking for that. Uh, looking Duly noted. For, could be. Uh, one, one other, one last point. It's something you and I have talked about before. I, and I, and I'll, I, I want to let us get on with the meeting. I, you know, 
We continue to need information. I have probably over a dozen plus questions pending to you, your team right now, for information about parts of this proposal. I look forward to getting that. I know Chairman McAnally is looking for information too. Um, so look forward to getting that. Another concern I have that I've heard recently, and it's something you and I have talked about in the past, uh, one on one, is, is about astroturfing. You know, my feelings are well known about astroturfing and the astroturfing activities that have happened at the fairgrounds. I'm not, not a fan of it. I don't think it's productive. I don't think it's real. I think we can get to a real good deal if we have honest conversations and if Bristol listens to the community. Um, unfortunately, and, and you've made me a very clear assurance, which I appreciate, that, that you have control over that situation as one of the leaders of Bristol's team. Um, I've received some very concerning suggestions recently that we're starting to get some astroturfing activities, that uh, the well-known uh, astroturfing firm is trying to insert artificial, supposedly public input into feedback processes to make the appearance of public support, which I don't think is necessary. Um, I, I, think that, I think that it just is, is detrimental. Um, so I would just, again, per our previous conversations, look to, to control that and to, 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 get, to get the manufacturing of, of sort of just noise in the air to a minimum. And let's just focus on real public feedback. And, and when this plan gets to a detail, just getting some details and, and really amending the plan to make sure it's responsive to public concern. Any other questions for Mr. Weaver? Great, Mr. Phillips, did you want to add anything? Not to put you on the spot. Well, good morning. Good morning. Am I close enough? Yeah. <laughs> um, we, as Mr. Weaver pointed out, we had a meeting Friday that was productive. Uh, I'd be less than honest if I didn't say that I had wished we could have gone a little further, but the fact is we're putting pencil to paper and figuring out the, the numbers. And that's where we are. I've got two meetings, uh, one tomorrow and another one Friday uh, with bond council, with uh, finance department, with legal department. And so we're moving forward. Uh, we'd all like to move quicker so that we can get a proposed agreement to the board here for your consideration. Uh, our goal is a sound uh, proposal that benefits all of Nashville and that will increase the value of this property and um, assist and contribute to making it a destination point in the city uh, statewide and hopefully Nashville, uh, nationally. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Phillips? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Phillips, for attending. Appreciate it. Um, just curious if you, uh, if the mayor's office has any deadlines or uh, input on when the board should expect to uh, receive the financing and, and other information. Uh, the letter of intent has a July 31 deadline. We may well have to extend that, uh, but I don't see that that's a problem. And some of the facts have changed since that was drafted. Uh, and signed, and so we're taking that into consideration. For example, some of the cost are more than was estimated uh, back in January. So I think we're being very realistic financially, legally, and then more importantly, uh, on the community side. And we want this to be something that everybody can be proud of and that it contributes to our community and not as a distraction. Mr. Phillips, on that on that community concern side, I have just used the opportunity. We're thrilled to have you here, and hope hope to have you here every month. Um, You're kind, Ms. Bergeron. Thank you. We'd love to see you, sir. Um, and just highlighting one of those big top line concerns that that the community is talking about, and that's a true lowering of impact, which is along the lines of those the, the communications I sent to you, you and Mr. Eagles a couple months ago. You know, the, the numbers I keep talking about are eight race weekends and 15 track rentals, nine race weekends and 12 track rentals, or 10-10. And I think the, it, the, that forms the framework of a really workable process. And then, and then you know, hard limits around that that say, okay, there aren't going to be loud cars on the track besides that. And if we, we get to those numbers and, you know, continue to honor the, 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 the three to seven time frame for track rentals, and, and we, but we get to those numbers, that's, a, that's the real foundation of a workable uh, 
a workable solution for the long term for the community. And so just giving you that, that uh, putting that bug in your ear again. Thanks. Right, for thank thanks, for thanks for listening. We, uh, we have enlisted um, outside counsel, if you will, uh, that uh, their specialty are, is in um, sports, including racing, uh, so that we make sure that we have a, uh, a proposal for you to consider that is sound and makes sense in every direction uh, with great emphasis on community. Thank you, Mr. Phillips, for being here. Thank you. Okay, so we will now, thank you, Mr. Weaver, thank you, Mr. Phillips. If we want to move on to Sherry's uh, amazing PowerPoint that I'm very excited to see. Can you pull this Will this move forward anymore? If not, I'm going to pull it. You know what? Can y'all hear me? No. Look at that. Little progress. Look at that. We are a team. <laughs> can y'all hear me? Everybody can hear me. That's a beautiful thing. As an audiologist, I worry about that. I think there are some people over here that can't. <laughs> can y'all y'all can't hear me? That's better. All right. Hold that. Button. Is that better? Hello. Okay. So I'm Sherry Weiner. I am an audiologist who has been in practice. I'm going to date myself. 1978. Um, I was fortunate to have my major professor at UT um, when I was getting my master's, who was actually quoted in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yes, I just dated myself again. Um, he was actually hired by the EPA and I'll reference this again during the little chat we have, um, but he was hired by the EPA to do noise studies of railroad noise as it was proximal to Knoxville um, elementary schools. And so I was lucky enough to be able to participate in that. Um, we also looked at what hair cell damage in the inner ear did um, to these darling little chinchillas and because they have the ear that's most close to a human ear. So early on, I had an opportunity to study that. Now, since then, I've done probably three noise studies because I'm not an acoustician. I understand it, um, but I don't delve into the nitty gritty numbers because I deal with the medical side. Um, but having said that um, I was asked to translate the noise speak today um, and and the logarithmic scales um, to something that's a little bit more relatable so while it's easy to get in the weeds and and really ramble on I'm gonna stick to the basics so that um, you'll have a little more clarity about um, how sound is measured and how noise accumulates and importantly how it's attenuated and what that means to the end listener. I will add that because I'm sitting here as a fair board commissioner, this is my disclaimer, I will not offer an opinion um, of what I think about this because we're going to vote and that would not be kosher. Um, if you wanna move, Laura, to the next one. What we're gonna do is just cover the decibel, how loud is loud, what attenuation is, the impact of attenuation on the listener. We're gonna review the Bristol proposal and the study insofar as I'll explain some of the numbers and what they mean. And then I'm gonna offer some takeaways. Laura. Okay, what's the decibel? What I can tell you it's not is it's not like inches, feet, yards, or miles. Inches, feet, yards, and miles are a fixed value. If you have 12 feet, then the number of inches that you have in those 12 feet are the same as you measure one to the other. The decibel is not like that. The decibel is logarithmic, and it's based on the amount of pressure that it takes to move the eardrum. And again, I could get in the weeds, but I'm not. Suffice it to say that our ears are super sensitive. They can hear anything from the brush of your fingertips 
to a jet plane taking off on the, tar on the tarmac that you might be standing on. In terms of those two sounds, those two sounds represent a, an increase in sound from the softest thing to that jet plane of roughly a trillion time increase. That's a big increase. And because our ear is so sensitive, they had to find a way to measure that appropriately and represent what it is we're hearing. And that's what we'll talk about. If you think about the softest sound being zero decibels for reference, and then you think about a whisper, and a whisper is roughly 25 decibels, sometimes 30 if it's a man whispering. The sound that you are listening to is roughly a difference of a thousand times when it's 30 decibels. When it's 20 decibels, it is a hundred time increase. So you can see that you're getting exponential increases in the multiple However, the actual hard number looks to be very small. Laura. So let's talk a minute about how loud is loud. What I did is I just pulled a chart with some common sounds, and I know you've seen a lot of this before, and maybe the 357 Magnum and the rocket launch aren't common sounds, but I wanted you to see that for reference. What I've shared are the average measured intensities in decibels. Anything above 85 gets the attention of those of us who are concerned about noise prevention and occupational sound protection, whether it's in a manufacturing industry or what I did for 25 years was in the music industry. If you're exposed to anything over that, then as you increase the intensity by five decibels, you have to reduce the amount of time that you are exposed to that sound in half. So for example, a 90 decibel impact sound that's roughly like a bass drum, a 90 decibel sound unprotected, you can listen to for roughly eight hours. If you increase that to 95 decibels, which would be like a food processor, you're standing in your kitchen, you can only stand there unprotected for four hours if you're in a workspace. Now, those are the OSHA regulations. There's another group called NIOSH, and NIOSH is a little bit more stringent than OSHA is, but OSHA is who regulates us. NIOSH is who recommends for us in terms of noise damage. So as you can see, and again, this references the importance of understanding the power and the pressure to move the eardrum behind elevating intensities, you can only listen to a 100 decibel sound for two hours. That would be a helicopter. You can listen to 105 decibels for one hour or so. Now these guidelines are meant for occupational workplace, but I will share with you a music industry a band without ear monitors is equally, equally endangered. And so these things are some of the numbers that we were looking at when Bristol put their report out there. And so this would help you when you look at those numbers, have a reference point to understand equivalent sound levels. So let's go to the next one. So what's attenuation? Attenuation is just the reduction of sound intensity, the reduction of sound volume. Sometimes you'll hear me use intensity and loudness and volume interchangeably, but they're really not. Intensity is what we measure. Volume is what we hear. Loudness is what we perceive in our head, okay? So you have, in, they're related, but we're looking at the measurement what our ear gets, and what our brain perceives. So how do you achieve attenuation? And these are some of the things that you saw in the Bristol study. We look at doubling the distance from the sound source or increasing the distance from the sound source. And if you double that distance from the sound source, you're gonna reduce the intensity by six decibels. So every time you double that distance away again, it's another drop of six decibels. We'll talk about the perception of that in a minute. 
They also recommended reducing the intensity of the sound at its source, like mufflers. That's another opportunity in the industry that is of prominence insofar as mitigating sound. Then you can provide barriers to impede the propagation of the sound or the movement of the sound and the length of exposure. And let's talk just a minute about impeding sound propagation. You know, they recommended a 20-foot wall. Well, think about how sound moves. If you throw a pebble in water and you see the ripple effect in the water, what that means is that that water is moving all around. It's moving out, but it doesn't take a linear path. Sound moves the same way. So one wall is going to protect one area, but it's not going to protect all of the area that could be impacted by the sound. And they addressed that in the study. They also suggested that if they went higher, they could certainly impact more sound mitigation, and there's a cost to that. Not going to speak one way or the other, but that was something else that was addressed, addressed in, the, in the proposal. And then also providing for sound absorptive materials. Sound absorptive materials like in the grandstands. Um, I've seen some where they put um, rubberized tire, um, broken up tire in the base of a track. I don't know if that works on a speedway, but those are just some examples of sound mitigation at the source. And then obviously um, reducing exposure time. Laura, we can go to the next one. So what I did here is I just highlighted the areas of what they proposed. So they proposed a limit of the 10 races. They offered a reduction in the practice days, curfews, adding engineering in the um, absorptive materials for the wall, et cetera. I'm not going to go through each thing because I'm sure each of you has read this report. But what it addresses are the things we've just talked about that are industry standards. The exposure time, the sound absorptive materials, the barriers to sound movement, mufflers at the sound source for non-NASCAR racing. They noted a 7 dBA reduction, if you'll see on the third to the bottom line. I had a question from someone who wanted to know what the A stood for. There are three essentially different weightings for how sound is measured. DBA is the sound weighting in a little sound level meter that specifies how the human ear responds to the weighted sound or to the sound. There's also C weighting and C weighting actually looks at how low pitches, low tones, bass tones impact the human ear and they're weighted in that direction. So they look at, at things like impact noise, um, explosions, mechanical noise. And then Z weighting, Z like in zebra, Z weighting actually references um, things like environmental sound, envir environmental noises. And so it does not take into consideration um, the human ear. So that's what that DBA stands for if you wondered what the A was. Um, let's go on to the next one, because we're going to look at the math, because the math tells your story here. Um, what I did is I took the numbers from the six homes in proximity to the racetrack that are referenced in the study. It references non-racing measures, maximum and averages for both the ProLate model 2019 and predicted NASCAR sound mitigation. So if we go to the next one, I pulled the list of common sounds and I added three columns because a picture's worth a thousand words. I put one column at the 2019 Pro Light model with um, maximums, with mufflers and the sound wall, and also the NASCAR predicted average with the sound wall. And I used their data to compare to the in those intensities to the sounds that we listen to at work, at home, in traffic, and well, anywhere. So you'll see that the 2019 race levels were noted up to 91 dBA, and that's on page five of the noise study, without sound mitigation. 
if you add the sound wall and the mufflers to the 2019 measures, the intensity drops to a high of 65 decibels according to the study. NASCAR's predicted average with the sound wall reflects an 80 to an 85 dB average. And I want you to note that I was looking at the six locations. And Laura, if we go back to that previous study, you'll see they have the 80 to 85 dB range or 90 to 95 dB with the NASCAR Max on a 20 foot sound wall in the third column. And you can see how it varies by location. So Laura, if we go back to the next one, to the next one, just go forward. No, go forward one. Yeah, next one. There you go. So if you look at this graph, what you're gonna see is I just highlighted the low end to the high end for each of the three circumstances that were referenced and compared that to the sounds that we listen to in everyday life. And the reason I did that is I wanted you to have a reference point. And those are the best real life reference points that I could offer. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So you remember I said that we look at the measurement of the intensity, the volume that we hear, and the loudness that we perceive. Well, we're gonna talk about the loudness perception here. And there have been all kinds of studies done for years in the workplace, in schools, as I referenced to the one that I did back in the 70s. Um, and those studies have offered things like equal loudness contours. So you know the volume of different pitches of sound and how they relate to each other. People typically are going to perceive a low frequency sound louder than a high frequency sound because there's more energy in the low frequencies than in the high frequencies. And that factors in to your perception of sound and the measurement. So if we, what this did, and I just pulled it from a, another company that um, is an acoustician group. If you look at, for example, in your first column, the 2019 races at the maximum levels, and then you look at in the far right where you see average PLM attenuation, that is just the difference between no mitigation and mitigation from the study. And then I compared those attenuation numbers to the perceived volume reduction from that chart. And what you see is anywhere from a perceived volume reduction, not an actual reduction in intensity, but the perceived volume at the ear or at the listener for anywhere from 53% at Klein to a 93% reduction at Sadler Court. Again, this is not a hard and fast, we're reducing the sound intensity 93%. This means the way you're going to perceive it at your ear is that it is a substantial reduction. And that's the message that I wanted to share because there's a difference between the intensity and the perception of that intensity. So um, if you look down at the NASCAR numbers, which is the bottom row, you'll see that those numbers are quite different. You'll see, and I know there's been a lot of reference to the, we're gonna reduce it 50%. Well, this is how you got to it. This is how that number came about. And I know that there were questions about how that number came about. And that is referencing the loudness perception at the ear of 50% at Southern Turf Drive. The others were down to 32%. Again, it's a reduction of perception of a third of the volume that they're perceiving now. And that's where that number came from. So I hope that answers the most common question that I'm getting. Let's go on to the next one. Here's another question that I've gotten a lot of, and I know this is, looks pretty elementary, but it's the best way to explain it. I had somebody call me and ask me about the cumulative loudness of all of the cars on the racetrack and wondered why the collective loudness wasn't registering higher. So this is the way you add loudness. You can't add 
97 and 97 and 97 and 97 and expect that you're going to get the correct logarithmic value. That's not the way it works. If you have two sounds of equal volume, you add three decibels to the volume of the first vehicle. Okay, it's like that whether it's sound amplifiers, whether it's a bass drum and you have a marching band, it doesn't matter. When you have two sound sources of equivalent volume, you just add three, d three dB to the next one. That's when you have two sound sources. But what happens if you have multiple sound sources? According to the literature and the studies that have been done, and your acousticians can get into the weeds on this one, it's going to be anywhere from a one to two decibel addition per, in this case, car, that will add up in this situation, in this example, to 104 decibels. So you're not going to get 97 times 10 cars. You're going to get, in this case, 104 with six cars. And that was the example that I, that I shared. I hope that that clears that up as well. And then lastly, let's talk about some of the takeaways. And I hate that I took so long, but I could probably talk for three hours and you'd be asleep in your chairs. Um, so the pro-late models saw the greatest attenuation with a combination of mufflers and the sound wall from 11 decibel to 30 decibel attenuation, roughly, average. NASCAR sees a 25 to 50 percent attenuation and that is perceived sound, and I should have put perceived volume reduction instead of attenuation there, with the sound wall and no muffler attenuation. There is a 53 to 93% perceived quieter volume for the prolate model races. There's a 32 to 50%, as I shared, perceived quieter volume for the NASCAR races. Additional noise mitigation would occur with future construction just by placing more barriers around the property to protect those areas outside of the property. They also did what we asked and provided heat maps that will offer comparisons by neighborhood so you can see the actual impact based on the mitigation that has been offered around the property. Um, I hope that clarifies a lot of the questions. I'm happy to try to answer, but I believe that you've got people from Bristol here that could do a better job of that. We really, really appreciate that. That was incredibly helpful. Um, any questions from the board for Commissioner Weiner? I just want to say th thank you. I know there's a lot of work put into it, so thank you for putting in layman's terms for us. Thanks. Glad to help. I do have a, a couple questions, um, and one first one maybe asking you to get into meteorology. Um, so I'll try not to do that. <laughs> um, it it, it kind of goes to those surrounding environmental factors. Um, so one one uh, one thing I've heard over the years uh, a lot when I've uh, being involved with speedway discussions. Um, you know, there'll be weekends under under previous promoters where we had concerns about whether mufflers were actually being used or not, and um, and, and, the, and we would get responses sometimes because the community would reach out to me and say, it's, it's really bad this weekend, it's really bad. And over the years, I can't tell you how many different weather conditions I've had relayed to me as, well, it's because it's because it's hot. Well, it's because it's cold. Well, it's because it's cloudy. Well, it's because it, it rained two days ago. And it, at some point that gets a little bit silly. Um, but I, what I'm trying to drill down in is the real weather conditions and the real variances from these predicted baselines that we can expect from weather so that we can have sort of an honest um, expectation to say, okay, you know, we can really expect 5%, 2% variance as a result of varying weather. And also if we can actually talk about what, what actual weather conditions actually may make perceived noise intensity more or and or the distance of it seem, uh, it, 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 you know, further away actually make it seem louder further away okay so there are two answers to that question one's going to be an answer now and the other one's going to be i'm going to get you a graph okay. that will give you a little more information as to the impact but cold and hot change the molecular structure of the air without getting into the weeds i'm not going to talk about molecular structure <laughs> of the air but it will impact how sound moves 
and I'll get you that. Okay. Um, the wind affects it. If the wind is blowing one way, guess which way the sound's going? That way. Mm -hmm. And so I'll provide that to you as well. And I thought about putting that slide in here and decided against it because I didn't want to get in the weeds. Um, but I'll get in the weeds for you. Okay. Um, going back to, to the, the, the in sort of initial design concepts, I know we're a long way away from having details and we're still waiting on a lot of those. You know, the, the design concept um, we've seen has a sort of space between where the brand new part of the bleachers will be built on top of the previous bleachers, and then there'll be additional grandstands around turn one, and there's sort of a gap there um, that may be sort of a big entry space or a, a gap for cars to come in and whatnot. And how a gap like that, where, where the grandstand structure is supposed to itself be a a noise mitigation barrier. I have concerns about the impact that could have on the apartments right behind there that are being built. How, when it get with a gap like that in between a big structure, how much can that do in that space to sort of um, create sort of a, a gap or a, a weakness in that mitigation structure? I'm going to toss this question to Laura because I, we had spoken with Dirk and the guys about that okay. apartment building. And he sub they've done some studies. Yeah, I won't. And um, Laura, you want to speak to that? Uh, you are correct. And actually, Dirk has a presentation today to share some of that information. So I think it's even best for me to toss it to him once we sure. uh, get to the Market Street presentation. Thank you. And then I have one last one last request, which is, um, since it's the only time we can ever talk. Um, You're going to make me write something down <laughs> again. So um, all of the, you know, I, I, that environmental question was uh, surrounding trying to get to the baseline and variance, getting understanding variance for weather. But all of the baselines and var you know, allowances in the world are only as good as what we actually see over in real time in, in the in, over the years. And um, uh, you know, one thing that I go back to is an early meeting with Jerry Caldwell where he assured me they understand about sound monitoring because they have to do it at Sonoma Raceway in Sonoma, California. And I spent several hours digging back through the land and use permits uh, th that go for with Sonoma Raceway going back to the 90s. And indeed, they are required to conduct ongoing sound monitoring forever. And I think that that would be a really important piece of this agreement is having Bristol having to have auditable sound monitoring requirements at all times for all activities that involve race cars like this to see if these baselines are, are sort of met. And so what the request I have is, is utilizing your expertise a little bit to help provide some input to Laura and to Chairwoman McAnally around what a real good, robust sound monitoring program that they should have to take on would be so that if they don't meet it three years, four years down the road, we have to come back and say, okay, well, no, we got to make curfews maybe a little earlier because that's probably the only way we're going to be able to change things once the structure's built. So I was just hoping that you might be, well, you know, it seems like it would have to be something where there'd be monitoring on campus and off campus anytime there's a race car on the track. And I was just hoping maybe you could provide some feedback over the next weeks to Laura uh, about what a real robust monitoring program looks like to ensure that, you know, if we get through everything else, we have a way to see if these numbers are actually met over time. So um, I'm never at a loss for words. I'm never one to shy away from giving my opinion. I'm always happy to, to offer my thoughts. Um, in this instance, I'd be happy to review um, anything that they want to present. Okay. Um, I'm happy to hear what the acousticians say because they're the ones that actually put these things together. Um, and look at what best practices are at, at other facilities, and I think that's more than reasonable. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much. That was very, very helpful, and look forward to continuing to um, hear from Laura about what you have to say about that. Um, if there's no other, Laura, are we good? BMS update? Yes. Okay. Great. Then we will move on to community impact speedway policy discussion and consideration. 
Commissioner Bergeron. I, I know we have a long agenda. I, I just appreciate the the chairs and the the board's willingness to continue to have this as a as a regular uh, item to kind of track along. It's important. It matters. I continue to receive panicked calls and emails uh, several to a dozen times a day from residents who want to know what's going on, who are worried, who have not received details, who have attended the community meetings and have had millions of questions not answered. Um, so we just need more detail. Um, and I just keep keep hammering home on what real impact looks like. Less, less race weekends, a lot less track rentals. And there are ways we can do this. We can, we can get this done. And that doesn't mean that doesn't mean asking for those things is opposing the deal. I'm getting really tired of uh, some folks sort of suggesting that. We're trying to make a good deal here. Um, and then just reiterating what, what I just asked Commissioner Wiener about, um, you know, I think any, any good proposal here is going to have a strong sound monitoring mar obligation that Bristol has to take on and that has to uh, be reliable that we can audit the results of and review. Um, so that if over time, if five years down the road, if seven years down the road, it, it turns out that though these numbers were incorrect for some reason and, and the impact is much higher, then, then the, the terms of how those races are conducted can change if they don't meet that baseline. I think that's imminently reasonable. Um, and, you know, would love to talk about any of that, would love to talk about, uh, you know, track rental amounts and race amounts if anybody wants to. Uh, just thanks for continuing to listen. Absolutely. Any questions for Commissioner Bergeron? Okay, great. Then we will move on to Fairgrounds Improvement Project and Infrastructure Update. Mr. Henley? <coughs> Hear me okay? Yeah. Thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, good morning, board. Can you, uh, no, no, here. Still Maybe closer? Still, still yeah. closer? Okay, there we go. All right. Hopefully that's pretty good. Um, well, first off, it's a pleasure to be able to address the board, the staff, council in person again. Um, my first in-person meeting. Um, so glad to do that. Um, I believe that you all have um, in front of you in your packets um, the latest updated versions of the um, budget dashboard regarding the fairgrounds improvement projects. So um, if you had a chance to review those, I'm gonna be able to address the questions you might have. But I'm also gonna walk through a few of the highlights um, just to make sure that everyone gets a, an adequate update based on this period. Start by saying, as I always like to do, um, the figures that you're looking at, particularly related to construction and some of the items are about 45 to 60 days in arrears, right? So if you were to leave this meeting, go out and walk the site, particularly where the multi-purpose and maintenance building is happening. Um, they're a lot further along than some of the numbers that you'll, you'll see today. But uh, a few of the highlights I wanna address, I'll start particularly with the expo building that we're in right now. Um, you'll see on that line item for construction that there's approximately $100,000 remaining. Um, as Laura alluded to, there's some repair work that's needed in expo one. Um, those dollars are held there for those services um, of course, anticipating a start of those in the coming days so that we can meet the schedule related to the September 1st opening. The other line items that are there, again, are just uh, helping us get across the finish line. Not a lot of activity or movement, but one that I would draw your attention to is the FF&E line item. Um, that line item currently has approximately $150,000 there. Um, there's continuous effort um, with fairground staff uh, as well as our team to really assess that um, value as operations have taken place before but also are planning to ramp up again. Um, fairground staff is getting a really good idea of what they need, areas that may be um, a little bit of a shortfall in the FF&E space and so we're looking at how to expend those dollars and evaluating that line item in case it may need to grow um, but for good purpose and, and we have funds that are set aside to accommodate that growth. move to the next section um, if there aren't questions there about the maintenance building um, you'll see that there's only a slight amount of dollars spent out of that total budget for construction um, that's largely due to the fact that we um, were not permitted to really start work until uh, about two months ago and so we've had um, a lot of activity in the past 45 days particularly related to grading on our site I'm excited to keep going as we go through the summer 
Uh, we worked out some logistical access for, for our contractors, which is also great. Um, but one thing that we've dealt with um, is some escalation in costs. Um, that's not particular to this project. This is happening all over the city, all over the region, all over the nation. Um, but just want to give the board the update that we've had that discussion with our contractor. We've assessed those costs. They're captured within the line item that you see. Um, they're not putting a financial burden on that project in a way that we cannot handle that. So just wanted to make sure that update was provided. Um, I know there may be a lot of conversations about other projects, both the public and private sector, that are experiencing a lot of cost burdens. Um, and so just wanted to make sure that the board was aware that our team has went through some due diligence there. We've had, it, we've had and will continue to have some conversations with our contractor, um, but making sure that you all are aware that we have that cost covered. Um, demolition is the next section that's there. Um, there's been no activity financially related to that, but there is evaluation based on enabling um, construction to continue um, for the MLS stadium as well as infrastructure. Laura and I have conversations about exactly how things are going to be handled as we continue to move forward with the fairgrounds as a campus in its entirety. Um, so there are dollars there, but again, making sure that the appropriate source, the appropriate um, responsible party is covering those. Um, so there's been no movement there, but just want to let you know that those funds are, are being monitored for those purposes. You do have um, the grandstands, which there's a few straggling costs that we're just waiting for invoices on, but very minimal. Um, no activity in the last period there. And of course, a lot of the previous costs um, dating all the way back to 2017 are still captured in this budget, uh, but no activity in that section. And then um, finally, on the second page of the report, just to highlight um, Fair Park Phase 1, um, there's been no financial activity um, in, the, in the last period. Um, but again, continuing to monitor those dollars um, and where they stand in terms of funds related to uh, the fair board. Happy to uh, address any questions that may be had. Um, if not, I'll remain here, but if not, I'll pass it to Ron so he can give a more detailed update on where we stand. I, I will take a moment, if it's if it's okay, just to um, let you know that we do have an ordinance going to council on the 20th, and what that does is extends our um, architecture contract. Um, originally, that contract was procured via RFP, and it was set for 60 months, but with the bit of delay that it took to get um, permitting and get going on the maintenance building. We wanted to continue to have um, Adkinson representing that project. And so the ordinance will change their contract to project completion instead of 60 months, but there's no additional funding that's being requested. It's just a time increase so that they can finish our, our maintenance building project. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. It is good to be back in the building. Uh, we're excited about this, and I want to count, compliment count, uh, Commissioner Wing, Wiener on that presentation. I've sat through a lot of those. That was the best one I've sat through. So uh, I really appreciate that. We may ask you to do that for some other projects. Uh -oh. uh, we, uh, as Ed said, the multipurpose building is under construction. We're making progress. In fact, we just have a lot of construction going on and things are going very well. Uh, the infrastructure project is well underway. You know, that's a sports authority project. You can see all the road work and they're starting the bridge and uh, that, <clears throat> that's happening. Um, we're coordinating with all the variety of projects on campus. You're gonna hear about mixed use, which is gonna be starting up, but we've also got the stadium work and other projects going around the campus. So there's a lot of activity going on. It all, all is going well. Uh, just want to let you know that that's in progress. Um, one thing I will remind you of is that it's about two years since we opened this facility. The warranties expired about a year ago when we did not have access to the interiors. So we're working with Skanska and they've been really good to work with us on dealing with warranty items where they could get into the facility. So that's going on. And then phase two of Fair Park is in the organizational phase and will be proceeding quickly. So it's a short version of a lot of work going on. Can I answer any questions? 
Thank you, Ron. Um, I uh, had a question uh, since uh, I have, we haven't been out here in a, in a little bit uh, with, with everything going on. Uh, just noticing that looks like the construction kind of creep has uh, gone around more of the building that or more of the property than I expected. And, and I, I just want, I guess, to understand from you and Laura, I guess, when we start having events here, we will uh, soon, you know, how that will affect operations. And, you know, specifically us all, you know, our entire parking lot was used. There's now buildings, uh, trailers over here. And so I just want to make sure we're not shooting ourselves in the foot, that kind of thing. First of all, there's a lot of coordination going on. And uh, I want to compliment Laura and their staff and working with us and, I, and as well as the various contractors that we have. Uh, we've got three different contractors under, under contract right now on the campus, uh, soon to be four. So we're all working very well together. Uh, and I think coordinating where people can park for what days. Uh, if you look at the parking lots, they're full, but a lot of work. We have like 400 workers on the stadium alone. So Laura, you want to add to that? I do, thank you. And um, yes, there's just a lot of adjustments. You know, can the, the level of craft workers over time increases for the stadium. That is expected to peak at about 600. So the need for, um, you know, getting the craft workers here is important. We're happy to provide parking when we don't need it. But I will say that the teams, Mortensen Messer, um, and Bell Construction, who is involved in the infrastructure, have been very willing to accommodate. And when we need space, for instance, like Saturday with our um, SRX race that we're hosting, we anticipate that to be a very, very well attended race. And so they're going to be, you know, relocating their parking to accommodate our needs. So they have been very gracious and very understanding and very flexible with how they run their daily business to accommodate our requests. So we will continue to move because as you saw, probably the biggest impact that you saw was the Benton extension that is coming down along turn four of the speedway. It's very exciting that that's being done because what that does, I'll remind you, is widens Benton and it also makes it ADA accessible, which is really huge for us. Um, we're going to have ADA accessibility on all sides of the campus um, that we've never had before. That said, we're going to also be seeing some impacts along Wedgwood starting the 19th of this month through the 13th of August. We're going to be shutting down the entrance, the intersection at Wedgwood and Rains. And so working with Bell on the infrastructure project, we will create a temporary exit off of Rains as it goes into the property and we'll actually be cutting through the parking lot instead of actually coming into the property at Wedgwood. There's some utility work that needs to be done there and that'll take approximately a month. Um, and then eventually when the Wedgwood work, you've already seen that a lot of the vegetation has been cleared from the um, north end of the track along uh, turns three and four and you saw see our old tunnel has been exposed it's the first time I've seen it since I've been here uh, but there will be some retaining wall work that happens along there as well as uh, just the creation of the road if you go a little bit further when you leave you'll start seeing the uh, grading and the work for the bridge that's going to cross Browns Creek if you'd like to take a look at that before you go <clears throat> Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, I also noticed a very nice green field where there used to be a voting center. Uh, instead of, I noticed a very nice green field where there used to be a voting center, so that was good. Uh, but I also wanted to kind of challenge the board, Ron, and uh, I see uh, Councilman Sledge showed up too. Is just, uh, you know, I look at that that space, and I and I just I can't help but thinking there may. I know we have our challenges with the you know the, the creek being there and whatnot, but I you know I hate to see a empty picnic shelter there you know full full time so i just i wondered what may be you know a better use or just thinking you know outside the box welcome the team's input zach you know just that's a that's a nice space and you know i know with our limitations but you know what more could it be well it, it's not in its final form 
that's what I will tell you. There is still some work that needs to be done in that area. We went ahead and put the pavilion in as part of phase one, but more work and more accessibility to that little space will be finalized in phase two. Well said. Any other, any other questions? I will say this, the coordination is going on. It's like week to week. It changes every week. My right hand's broken, my left hand doesn't work. Um, so at some point after this is over, can we have a chat about the speaker placement? I, I, I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> to my point, um, when we're done, can you and I have a chat about the speaker placement? Okay. Okay, great. We will, thank you so much, Mr. Henley and Mr. Gobble. We'll move on to divisional fair update. So I do want to keep this on this, the agenda as this kind of a standing item. I don't have um, a, a, a really an update at this point other than just acknowledging that we're continuing to work on, you know, ideas for divisional fair and um, that I, I hopefully we'll have a, a little bit of a more substantial update next month. Okay, great. Then moving right on to event update. Unless, does anyone have any questions about FAIR? Okay, great. Then we'll move on to event update. Yeah, so we do have Mr. Wallace here, and I know Bob is here, and I know he's also on a phone call, so I don't want to rush Bob, but he is also here, and because um, I do know that he wants to talk a little bit about um, the SRX race that we are hosting this weekend. Um, but as far as general events, Mr. Wallace? Thank you. Thank you and good morning to everyone. Uh, I uh, echo what Director Womack said, that we're excited to be back. And um, I also echo what she said about my excitement to get back to doing indoor events. Uh, it's what we do, and I think we do it well, so it's great to get back to that. Um, it's going to be an exciting weekend coming up that first week in August when we open up Expos 2 and 3. We'll have a home show and also a drum show in this facility. It'll be the first time to do that drum show. And what I really appreciate about the promoters is that he's one of the people that had a show in 2020, but decided to stay with us. And uh, that's some, that took some coordination because as someone as a small business like that, he could have went someplace else. And so we appreciate those promoters. That weekend also, we're gonna have a race and we're going to have, I uh, believe, uh, one of, one of uh, Mac, um, Commissioner McAnally's favorite events, Porter Flea, will be outside uh, in the shed. So it's going to be a very busy weekend. And like I said, it's important that um, those things happen. And I'm very excited and um, appreciate the question by uh, Commissioner Himmer about the coordination and, and getting, in, getting that um, explanation done. We, it is important uh, to the promoters that they know what coordination as far as parking is concerned. And uh, we have been very good at getting them the information that's been given. So we appreciate that and that continued uh, uh, cooperation. Um, coming up in September, we have filled uh, what the state fair, their, their dates with a very exciting event. It's a carnival called Thrillville by the Kiva Company. And if they're going to be out in the sanitation lot, which is the lot that you come in through Wedgwood to the right, the big lot. And they will be here uh, for two weeks and putting on a carnival. And it's very exciting because the gentleman that's doing this, one of the top uh, carnival uh, promotions persons in the country. And he came here, we showed him everything, and he said, I want that lot right there. And he's gonna, he decided to do a lot of coordination with us as well. And um, I think it's going to be exciting. So, and of course, when I told him that you know, our, our board members love to come to the events, and he said anytime, so we're excited about that. So it's, going, it's some exciting times coming on. And before you, we put, we decided to, instead of giving you a one month calendar, we gave you a three month calendar because of the new events that's coming up. Roller girls are back, they're in the sheds, they're outside, which is exciting. Um, also, we have the crits bikes that are on the racetrack still. 
They come every Wednesday and some other uh, events that are coming up. So we're excited uh, to be back here and we're excited to get back into the business that we do, which is uh, doing events. And um, Marianne and her crew having the, the fair, I mean, excuse me, the flea market outside has been a success, as Laura said. Um, it's just great to see people come back. It's kind of like a family reunion when they come here. So we're excited about that. So I want to thank you. If you have any questions? Thank you for that update, Scott. Can you uh, tell me a little bit more about the Thrillville Carnival? Is this like rides or sure. tents and elephants? Okay. So Molly and I were on a uh, very uh, good um, Zoom meeting with the gentleman that's putting it on. Uh, it's going to be rides. It's going to be food. And we thank D&D Events for coordinating with them uh, for that portion. Um, it's going to be rides, foods. They're going to. The one thing that we have to work on is their curfew um, that we're still working with them on. Uh, they want us. They want to go to eleven, but that's not what we're going to do. Um, but it's going to be rides. It's going to be food. It's going to be entertainment and all all of such. And it's going to be uh, every weeknight um, and also in the weekends for that for those two weeks that the fair used to have. And uh, so we're feeling we we were able to feel that and uh, excited about what they're going to bring to the fairground. So again, you know, you can bring your kids and all that. Let me know. <laughs> yes. Cotton candy. Uh, thank you. Um, and then uh, the race this weekend, what time is the race? I'm going to let um, Bob um, talk about the race. It's, that's exciting too. And um, we have, what we did was Laura and I have uh, also got some offsite parking as well and some events we're going to have to do that and we understand because of the construction it's just a normal thing and, I, and, and some of the things that Laura thought have thought about for parking is way outside of the box that I would have never thought of so we appreciate her knowledge on that and what some things we're going to do but Bob can is he ready he's on the phone, Let's wait, on the we can phone. Catch him. okay we can catch him later. you know I'm a uh, preacher so I can keep talking if you want yeah that's all right uh, <laughs> uh, when do we expect to have a flea market in here kind of get back to normal Standard. The, the uh, September is our target date um, to have an indoor flea market, and um, if uh, Marianne is here, she wants to talk about that. It's um, we, once we get the bill, we we were a little bit cognizant of maybe the building's not being ready, and we want to sound the alarm and say, "Hey, July or Hey, August." So Laura decided, which was uh, I think very good, because not only that, we'll have a we'll have one under our belt before our very biggest one, which is October. So it's gonna it's going to help us a whole lot. And I know uh, one of some of the things just talking about uh, our, our staff was Satrice and, and everyone else have come together. It's, it's totally a team effort to be back here. And those things like that, we need to make sure that we take the steps and not step quick, too quick. So her leadership on that was very important to say September was the target date for us to be back in here fully. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Wallace? I will, I will just reiterate what Scott said about flexibility. Our promoters have been extremely flexible. Many of them have opted to take indoor events outside. Um, we had originally scheduled some of the events to happen in some of our outer parking lots, but when we didn't know exactly when um, the buildings were going to become available again, and they have adjusted from out lots to sheds and areas close to this building. So they have been extremely flexible with us in order to, um, again, stay with us and, and adapt to our changing environment. One, one other thought I had, and kind of talked about it before, but just looking at the budget numbers and, and seeing how, you know, we have a little bit of flexibility, it looks like, you know, I think it'd be good to understand or, or maybe you and Laura work together on more like a, a promoter, uh, you know, marketing campaign, so to speak, for, for, you know, 2022, just letting them know we're open, you know, outreaching to new folks. I mean, we got a lot of uh, calendar to fill and, uh, and when things return to normal, thinking long term and um, kind of a, a relaunch, so to speak. It's really a launch of our yeah. building, essentially. Um, you know, um, so just, just think it through those things, which you're currently doing, but accentuating on that. And to that, we haven't been in the building for a year yet. So it's like we're trying to learn the building, too. So we, we went from August to March, and then we closed down. So definitely uh, we'll have some 
work together by then to kind of do that. But honestly, we have a lot of, and we, Lord, we did an exercise because we have to give the 2022 calendar to uh, the, the uh, soccer people. And um, a lot of our weekends are already filled, a lot of them. So um, there's some, of course, from now until next year sometime, people are always calling about renting the buildings. Uh, so we uh, feel like we're going to have a great uh, the ability to fill the buildings. And I know that's important to you. And, and I definitely will keep you in, um, um, abreast on that. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's the case. You know, maybe we look at start thinking more outside the box weekday events. I know we talked yeah. about that. I mean, I, I want us to really get aggressive and, and think think different. And, you know, we make the best in use of the facilities. And I did, we did get a card show, so I forgot to tell you about that. The what? A card show, the one you were talking about. Yeah, we did, we did get that. I, I wish I knew the date, it's in 2022. June, I think, of 2022. Yeah. But pre-pandemic, we were in the process of coordinating an open house. Um, yep. Yeah, so we, we'll revisit that when we get the buildings up and going. Yeah. Commissioner Berger? Well, one weekday event on the, on the subject I, I did want to bring up, and it's uh, just, it was, it was pre-pandemic, which seems like a lifetime ago, but, um, some attorneys had reached out to me who practice in, in the bankruptcy space. And, you know, I think that the use of the bankruptcy court in the custom house on Broadway is becoming more and more challenging to do business um, in that location. Parking is really tough. And they have 341 meetings, you know, debtors meetings and, and you know, a regular docket of meetings during the day in the mornings. And a couple attorneys had reached out to me sort of saying, hey, we see there's these new buildings, the fairgrounds, and you know, these could be, that could, so I don't, you know, that would be up to the trustees and all that, but that could be something where it might be an opportunity where the meeting space is needed like on you know, Tuesday mornings, Wednesday mornings, yeah. they could really use big space where parking is easy. Um, so that might be something, and I could try to get y'all in touch with somebody, yep. but that could be a great weekday regular event. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm speaking for lots of people, including, <laughs> Yeah. Actor, but we should we should explore it and see if maybe something like that sure. uh, on a regular cadence that wouldn't interfere with our regular entertainment events might be an opportunity. Yeah, that would be awesome. I think that that's, that was the uh, goal of Commissioner McAnally when we had that meeting about the open uh, having an open house to be able to show the buildings off. And then right after that, we had the uh, pandemic. So I, I think those things like that and, and, and any ideas that you have, I'm well open. Email, text messages, call. We'd be, we'd be glad to look into that and uh commissioner himmer is great about telling me things like that that come up and we we do we do pursue it excellent thank you mr wallace mr Sargent, did you want to hello hi I think I was just asked to come to kind of explain a little bit of update on our situations, what we have going on with our weekly, we have a few of the regional national races that we call, and um, this weekend is, is a large one, so I want to kind of give an update on that. This is what we call the SRX series, it's a national series with some NASCAR drivers. We have sold a uh, majority of our tickets for the grandstand, so we're very happy about that. We could be sold out. So that becomes um, a few more challenges with our construction going on and parking that we seem to have had several meetings and be under control. Um, it's very scripted and time-wise from um, seven o'clock to nine o'clock on national television, CBS. So the fairgrounds will get some extreme amount of um, exposure. They're reaching, they're one of the highest viewed shows on television right now. Um, so well, close to 2 million people are getting 1.6, 1.7 million people. So again, some great exposure for the fairgrounds, the city of Nashville, everyone's been very cooperative. So we're looking forward to that. I know there's some talk about mufflers and things of that nature. And I've been working with Jason very closely on that. We still feel we're in, in a progressive mode and we're, we've made a lot of progress. Just a quick update on that. Um, we will probably go to a spec muffler next year. So. I know there's a lot of talk about what's happened in the past and we're building off of that, those problems and trying to be proactive with Jason and some other people in the community and the industry. So just a quick update there. We still feel we're progressing very nicely with that situation for 2022, that there'll be a mandatory spec. There'll be no more questions about, it used to be if they even had them on, then this year we tried to give them some recommended. So we'll go to a, a thing where we know not only they have them on, we know which one they have on, things of that nature. So we feel very comfortable with that going forward. 
Um, there was some question about a Friday night race this weekend. An explanation of that. We had the quarter mile, which is the local, very local guys that race the little track inside. And um, we give them eight races a year, which is very borderline to being enough. Most racetracks in the United States, they get 20 to 25 races a year. So what comes into play there is guys, families have expenses in those cars. A, it is their hobby, so there's a limit on how many they would like to do a year. B, they have sponsors and things of that nature. So what happened was we have our, in our contract that we could have 10 this year. We only scheduled nine total, so we felt we had one extra, and these guys only had eight. So an average of a racetrack is three to five rainouts a year. So just say we had two rainouts. That gets them down to possibly five or six events a year. So we felt that we needed to give them a Friday night, which we already had a practice scheduled, and we um, had um, just a quarter mile racing. And we'll be very conscious on curfew. So that's a little explanation of why we're racing the quarter mile on this Friday night, so that we didn't have to schedule another time. We could come in on a weekend when we're already here. Again, being trying to be very cognizant of the neighbors and the noise, and also trying that balance of giving these, these teams the, the, the local guys, they're just due of getting the chance to race throughout the season. So I hope that explains a little bit. Then when we talk about 10, 6, 8, some rain outs in there, that we really try that balance to get them a reasonable amount, and they don't have the conscious or the, the thing that, you know, we're overtaking or we're not caring about the local guys, because we truly do. We think that's a good infrastructure a good fabric of the community. Most of those guys and families are the kids that grow up, the families that live in the neighborhood or the community. They don't come from different states. They live right here. So we, we really try to be conscious of their needs also. So there's a little explanation, and then I'm kind of open for a quick couple questions if you need. What, what time is the racing Friday night? Friday night, that's a good question. So uh, we have the SRX series is 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. That's the CBS live time frame, just like you would watch a sitcom. And, um, and then we have our late models racing. We were conscious of curfew. So what we did for this race, we split it in half. We're kind of making, I'm not the most popular guy in the racing garage right now, but I was concerned about starting our late models after the CBS time slot and not getting in curfew time. So we put half the late model race at five o'clock They'll, they'll stop at halfway point, let the CBS time go, then we'll finish our second half at 9 p.m., hopefully get done by quarter till 10, our normal curfew. Sorry, you said fr Friday night there's racing? That's Saturday night, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. You asked Friday night? Yes, sir. That uh, starts at 5, we hope to be done by 9, 9.30, whatever, with yellow flags. It's Again, it's just the quarter mile, so noise should be much less than the big 5 eighths. And, and these schedules will be all posted on our website, we can push them out anywhere you want. It's a minute-by-minute minute schedule for the whole weekend. Hey, Bob, I just wanted sort of to clarify on, on kind of what we're – just so the community understands. So so with with this race included this weekend, we're, we're looking at nine for the for the total for the season. We scheduled nine, yes. Nine, yeah. And so so I just want to be clear to the community that what's happening, we are, we are only – this, what we're doing is sort of condensing two weekends into one. This, we drive to, yes. Weekend. Yeah. Great. Um, and then just appreciate your attempts to get things done by 9 on Friday night. As you know, the generally Friday nights are just for practice, and they go till 9. Um, and yep. so um, just saying that out loud because, the, you know, Mr. Weaver and his folks at Bristol always want to try to say everything's precedential, and they get to do that. Uh, so this is, a, this is a bit of a rare circ one-off circumstance. Um, and, then, and then so you, the, the late model race, when it's continued starting a little after 9 o'clock on Saturday night, you think that you can get that done before 10? We do believe so. That's our okay. goal. Yes. Great. That's Thank our goal. You. And another thing that we did for that to help is we follow NFL and we do watch Major League Sports, how they do things. And with this large, extremely large crowd, we felt like dumping everybody into the streets at 9 o'clock at one time could be a traffic problem. This way we can have a little bit of a race afterwards and alleviate the traffic surge. So there were many factors that came into this that I think were all positive for the, the neighborhood. For a baseline for folks listening out there, are, are the SRX races, are those those uh, cars used in, in those races, are, do those use mufflers? They do. They That was actually the last test they came here just to do mufflers. Okay. They did not at other racetracks, and they we forced them to have mufflers on this race, and they came and tested those mufflers. Okay. So they will have mufflers on, yes. Thanks.
We really appreciate your flexibility and ingenuity <laughs> in shifting yeah. things around. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks. All right. We will move on now to new business. First up is the Stand Up Nashville presentation on community survey. going to give Hannah a chance to pass all of these lovely pamphlets out to everyone. But good morning. How are you all doing today? Good. Thank you for being here. So hello, my name is Kendacy Lafayette. I'm with Stand Up Nashville. I'm sure you're used to seeing my face at this point. But I do want to thank you all for allowing us to have the chance to be here and just share with you the results of our racetrack survey. Um, so I'll just start by saying um, who Stand Up Nashville is. So we are a community organization that focuses on racial and social justice work through an economic lens. And we also want to ensure that community voices are centered in any decision making process. Hence why we are here today. Um, so we can go to the first slide. Um, as you are aware, in March of this year, Stand Up Na uh, excuse me, Nashville and Bristol Motor Speedways entered into a letter of intent to revamp the Nashville Fairground Speedway and see NASCAR racing return to the track. So the question was, what do the neighbors of the Nashville Fairground Speedway really think about this proposed racetrack expansion? After attending a few of these meetings, we started to realize that was a question that wasn't really being answered, so we took things into our own hands. Uh, and over the course of two months, we knocked over a thousand doors, surveying more than 500 residents online and in person, and then just calculating the results with surveys that were taken within a two mile radius of the racetrack. And we can go on to the next slide. Um, we can go to the next one too. <laughs> so basically I'll start with some of our top line information and then I'll get down into the more nitty gritty details. A majority of our residents surveyed do not support the racetrack expansion plan as is. We found that 34% do support the current plan, 55% did not support the plan, and then there was an 11% that felt like there was just not enough information to make a decision yet. So we can dig in a little further with our next slide. 74% of all residents surveyed did say that they had concerns about this development. The top two concerns um, on the next slide being noise and traffic. And we can go ahead to the next one. So something we heard a lot from residents were current roads and traffic management cannot handle the new demands. This city needs to start work on roads now and they haven't done a thing. Uh, I believe the next slide is another, is a quote about noise concerns. You know, they can't even listen to TV in the comfort of their own homes on a Saturday because the noise is so intense and loud. Um, and then we can move on. So some other concerns we had, gentrification, cost to the city, Lack of community input was a huge one. And then just impact on property values and moving further. So harm mitigation. We heard many residents say that they just did not support this plan at all. Like there's no getting around that. But we did ask the question, what measure could be taken to mitigate the harm it will cause to the community? So a small number of residents believe that it was already beneficial, but a vast majority of them had input on improvements they'd like to see before moving ahead. So on uh, this screen, or I believe in the pamphlets here, let me turn with you, there are these bubbles, and the size of those bubbles is actually proportional to the frequency in which we heard these concerns. So the largest bubble being community investment and community development. Moving on to another benefit was parking, traffic, other infrastructure improvements. Then you have noise mitigation, then the smaller bubble is kind of workforce development, 
And then you have other, which includes benefits like um, environmental impact. And we can move on. So some key takeaways. Um, when Stand Up Nashville first started this process back in May, we came in with the mindset that there just needed to be more community engagement. It just needed to be better. And throughout this whole process of actually knocking these doors, having deep, meaningful conversations with the residents, it came to realize that it was a deep felt sentiment throughout the entire community. They just needed to be heard more, they needed to be engaged with more, and they just simply needed more time before everything was to take place. Um, Alrighty, and I believe we can, our next takeaway is it's important to note that these measures were seen as additional needs beyond the current proposed plan. Many people said that the efforts proposed by Bristol Motor Speedways to blunt the noise were not strong enough. We heard many people say that they were not convinced about this state-of-the-art sound barrier technology and that they didn't believe that there was anything materially that could be done to stifle the sound of NASCAR. And in our final slide, in conclusion, it's clear that this process is not popular. Among the residents we surveyed, um, not all of them were opposed to the plan. Some could find themselves being in support of it um, if community feedback was taken into account. But overall, it's clear that the current process was not popular and many residents believe it will lead to a reduced quality of life. And something I just want to add, when we were knocking these doors a lot, uh, most of the people we talked to, a huge percentage of them just felt like, there's nothing that we can do about this. They're gonna do what they're gonna do. It's something we heard time and time again. And they're just kind of like accepting their fate. They feel like this is just what's gonna happen with us. And they just kind of feel like it's gonna reduce the quality of life for them. So I wanna end by saying it is on this body and council to read this data, take it into account and do what needs to be done to include the community in the decision making process. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Any questions? For yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. First of all, thank you, thank you and your organization for doing the hard work of talking to the community members. Um, I was curious if you could share the uh, results, the actual survey results to the board. Say that again. Actual could, would you would you would y'all organization be willing to share the results, like the top line results? To Absolutely. The board so we we have um, them listed out. We could have that information forwarded to you. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then I was curious, I saw where you uh, said the, all the online respondents were filtered by location to only those from the area were counted. I was curious how y'all did that. Um, so we calculated within like a two mile radius of the racetrack, which neighborhoods would be taken into account. So I believe there were, okay, actually <laughs> our resident researcher, Tony, could answer that question better than I can. Thank you. So as a um, precautionary measure, all survey respondents were required to provide an address. So we likely won't be providing that because that becomes a privacy issue. But since we add that information, we can convert addresses to latitude and longitude. And then you can use various equations that determine the distance between two points on the planet and find the shortest distance between them. So essentially, we figure out the short, the two mile radius and keep all respondents who are within that two mile radius and use those for analysis. Yes. Thank you. Uh, one question on that. Did you, did you try to sort of filter and kind of confirm identities a little bit in that process as best you could? Um, yes. So part of it is we um, had, we had information on address, name, um, phone number, email f for follow up. So a lot of those information is really hard to fake, um, especially when you're asking for all of those follow up informations to ask if there are any questions about the survey. Another piece that we had is since there was questions about maybe s respondents trying to take surveys outside of the area, we were able to get information as part of the survey service that we used that tracked information on where the surveys were taken. And so surveys that were not taken within the city or within the state were not analyzed out of caution. Thanks. Ms. Lafayette, a quick one question for you. Have, have, has your organization met with representatives from Bristol Motor Speedway, if you're aware of? I, I am not aware that we have, okay. I believe. No. Well, Mr. Weaver's right there, and I think you all should meet. And I, I, I think 
I think y'all should uh, uh, get to know each other and have some conversations. And I, I would encourage you. I would encourage y'all to go talk, get, exchange information right now, since he's right there and you're right there, and maybe set up a meeting. I would love to hear that you guys have met. All righty. Thank you for that suggestion. <laughs> Anything else I could answer for y'all? Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. All right, last up in new business, we have Market Street Enterprises development update. Dirk? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Dirk Mountain with Market Street Enterprises. Uh, it sure is nice to see everybody in person again. Um, it's uh, been a long time coming. Um, I realize fully that I'm the last person standing between you and getting on with your day. So I'm gonna try to make my remarks uh, fairly brief, but I would be remiss not to thank uh, Ron Gobble and Laura Womack uh, for all their help on the uh, infrastructure and fairgrounds teams respectively to get us to this point. It's been a big uh, team effort and uh, we're about to in introduce another construction project onto the campus. So we're going to be very sensitive about that and, uh, and we're looking forward to getting started. Um, the next slide shows how busy we've been over the past few months. Thank you, Commissioner Weiner. Appreciate that. Um, so the uh, the team has been awfully busy uh, getting ready for uh, the presentation today. We're awfully proud of the work that's been put into this, and we've got a lot of uh, new information to share and a lot of new collateral to show. Um, so this is a new rendering of the uh, the campus, looking from Fair Park to the south toward the downtown view. Um, all three of the development blocks are now modeled conceptually in the plan, and we'll be happy to uh, describe those in a bit more detail a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, the next slide depicts a uh, aerial view of the, uh, the stadium that was actually only taken in March. And uh, so as you can tell, just looking outside, now the steel is up around the entire perimeter of the superstructure for the stadium. Uh, we're using this view uh, because the more recent drone shots are actually taken from the other direction. So this is the view that depicts uh, most accurately the orientation of the three development blocks in the mixed use master plan uh, compared to the orientation of the stadium uh, to the north, to the northeast and to the east. And uh, those are the projects that I'll be describing uh, in the time we have together today. Uh, the next slide depicts uh, the most current version of our mixed use development master plan uh, for the campus. Uh, we very creatively have labeled all the blocks A, B, and C. Uh, eventually that will change as we get through our naming and branding for the project. But uh, the, the project is substantially similar to what was approved uh, in the uh, master plan a few uh, couple years ago. Uh, the only real change that we've made to the plan of any substance is we, th we felt that uh, the far western end of the project was more appropriate to step down the scale of the building. So we have primarily six and eight story buildings in the plan. As you move off to the west and you see the little rectangles that are kind of collected in that village there, uh, those are townhomes that are three stories tall that relate better in scale to the single family residential buildings that are um, around that part of the neighborhood. So that is one change to the plan that we've made. Um, otherwise, everything is very similar um, to what you've seen before. The next rendering depicts the last uh, representation of the project uh, that we showed the fair board a few months ago. Uh, this was rendered in monochrome because at the time we had not selected the materials or the colors. Uh, for the project and we've made a little bit of progress uh, since then. So we have a new rendering uh, that is on the next slide that depicts uh, the final size and shape and massing for that project as we're looking at uh, the project now from the main entrance uh, to the stadium, which is the northeast entrance and the direction that we're facing is southeast uh, looking at the uh, 
Block C project, which will be the first uh, development in the uh, in the project, 328 units and 20,000 square feet of commercial space, uh, joined by a 500 space parking garage uh, to the south of that uh, of that facility. You can barely see on the left hand side a little sliver of the office building on Block B, and that will be um, in a future phase. Certainly, this uh, drawing depicts a uh, kind of a festival atmosphere, as if you're uh, coming into the match. Uh, for a soccer event and uh, the streets are shut down uh, as will be the case uh, many days of the year and uh, we hope that this is the atmosphere that actually uh, arrives on the site when uh, when soccer begins to play uh, in the next uh, couple years. The next rendering depicts a view from the other angle so this is as you, if you were standing uh, at the intersection of uh, Craighead and um, actually Wedgwood and the Benton Avenue extension, which is a new road that Ron's team is working on, um, where the Nashville Soccer Club logo is at the bottom left-hand side of this picture is the overhang for the Speedway. And so you can tell, uh, you know, we did a lot of work in the past couple years to reorient the size and shape of the Block C project behind it to move it away from the grandstands and away from Benton Avenue to create adequate space for future uh, speedway improvements and for a new public open space uh, that we now have a working name calling it Fair Plaza um, that's there. On the right hand side is uh, a couple of the buildings that will be in Block B in a future phase. Uh, closest to us on the right hand side is a potential hotel with a rooftop amenity space. And then behind that is a potential office building um, that uh, is about 180,000 square feet and a little bit taller in scale. And in the, in the very back of the rendering, you can see the northeast entrance to the, uh, to the stadium, which is the primary entrance to the stadium. Uh, I think we have one more rendering here that depicts a nighttime view. This is as if you're in a drone hovering over the uh, western boundary line of the, of the site. Looking toward the east, uh, the expo buildings are off in the distant background, to, uh, off to the left. Um, this shows the northern uh, facade of the stadium and the big public open space that's being created in front of that uh, as part of the uh, overall uh, stadium project uh, that will be accessible to the public um, during most times of the, of the season. The, uh, on the left-hand side is Block A. You see the townhouse village there. Uh, we're placing that there because that's a tremendous location, very attractive for, uh, for families with children. And it's also the location that is directly adjacent to um, where you can kind of see the orange awning there. That will be where the daycare center is. That's one of our commitments to the Community Benefits Agreement. Uh, and that will be delivered along with that building in the next phase of, uh, of, of development. So for the next slide, this kind of depicts um, where we are in a daytime view from the south. Um, the Block C building is the one that we're starting with, and that's the one between the, uh, the building and the, uh, and the speedway, and we're going to get into a little bit more detail on that. We've been asked by the community to basically address um, two major themes with uh, this project, and we want to be able to do that effectively. The first is, um, how, how will this project be affordable for residents who are in the community, who live nearby? And the second question is, um, how are we dealing with the sound issues that you have um, from the major you know, noise generators being the, the soccer stadium um, and the racetrack? So the next slide depicts uh, one way that we can address that. And actually, we're really encouraged by the market research that we did that basically says, if we're going to attract residents that live nearby, we need to be providing units that are at a price point that they can afford. And the market study that we were able to do seems to point to the fact that um, almost half of the prospective residents in the building earn 80% or less of, of uh, median income, which is about $47,000 a year. So what we have done is we've applied for both low-income housing tax credits with THDA and a pilot with MDHA in order to allow us to meet the market where it is and provide affordability in this building that approximates the incomes of the residents who would be attracted to live, to being able to live here. And so 48% of our residents earn 80% or less median income, and then 49% of the building by unit count will be affordable to residents um, at those levels. Um, we'll have additional affordability in the future phases, but um, this would be a major step for providing uh, mixed income housing for Nashville. And uh, you can see on the right-hand side some of the professions and jobs that some of those um, residents will be, uh, will be earning as, as they uh, kind of get into the project. We've also been asked to 
look at the uh, the sound situation. Um, I was very encouraged by Commissioner Weiner's uh, presentation. Um, she explained a lot of things that I don't have to now, which is uh, terrific. But uh, it, overall, we know that we have to design our project to the level of what the sound currently is and what the sound is projected to be. Um, so we measured uh, both a professional soccer match this season to find out what the sound impacts are uh, for that. We were not able to do that during COVID last year because of the uh, pandemic, but we're, we were able to do it uh, for, for this uh, May is when we took the study down in Orlando. Um, and then we also took measurements um, from our, uh, the, our future building site um, at the All-American 400 in October and measured those levels. And so um, our building will meet um, the sound reduction uh, that's required for both of those types of events, uh, both soccer matches and races. And we've designed the building in a way that that will be effective. But um, I was really interested in uh, Commissioner Weiner's um, analysis and look forward to working with um, any proposal for, for racing. And uh, like she said, any sort of mitigation will be, will be beneficial. Um, we're designing to what we know right now, but um, we would certainly be uh, very encouraged to be a part of that conversation and look forward to, uh, to moving on in that, uh, in that direction. So I think that may be the last slide, but um, with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Melton, um, on the uh, projected residents, I just wanted to sort of, I think it'd be beneficial for folks to some of the, hear some of the conversation when, when you answer some of my questions, which, you know, it's, it seemed to paint a picture that, that beyond the, the workforce housing commitments you've made as part of the community benefits agreement, the, the market rate apartments themselves are going to uh, likewise uh, not you know, have a significant portion of that, that bucket of units, which will likewise really be targeted at, at, way, at income levels that are, or that are not, not some of the levels we're seeing in some apartments in the area around here in Nashville. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you look at the demographic area around this location, um, there's tremendous diversity in incomes. Um, we have individuals who we think will earn as low as $30,000 and upwards of $120,000. Um, the key thing is, is that this is not a, a project that is going to be priced similar to what you might see in the, a downtown area or a Gulch or a Germantown or a Midtown. Um, this is really going to be crafted to the specific um, income dynamics of this area and will be you know, inherently more affordable than what you'll see in these other areas. The, the neat thing about it is, is that you know, we're able to do this through these financing tools that we've applied for both with the state and with the lo local government to really put together a tremendous model for being able to create this level of affordability. And I hope that this is a model that can be duplicated around the city because our unique ground lease with Metro gives us a lot of flexibility to be able to produce this housing and Metro's the largest landowner in, 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 the, in the city. Um, you know, I could see this being successful and being replicated in a number of ways throughout Metro. Um, as to uh, as to the, the sound data you you all your group was able to, to take have you had a chance to to sit down with the folks from the Bristol team and kind of run through both sets of your data to kind of confirm that it's collectively they form kind of a, a, a more enhanced you know a good baseline uh, collectively yeah. we, we haven't had that opportunity yet but we would look forward to doing so uh, okay. we, we'll share everything that we've got and uh, anything that benefits the community in terms of sound mitigation, we're all for it. Okay. And uh, one final question, which is, is I've asked some questions about some of the initial renderings we've seen of the Speedway and, you know, the sort of a potential little bit of a, a space or a gap between the new grandstands, the brand new grandstands and the brand new bleachers at turn one and want to ensure that while that is still being formulated and designed, it's done in a manner which uh, best acts as a true sound barrier. Um, have you all had a chance to talk about design with with the Bristol team? And also, have you had any sort of you have any feedback on sort of what a like a gap like that, which I, I, I just am concerned would be directed right at sort of block C um, kind of projecting sound? Have you had any discussions about that? You know, that's a great point because certainly any residential unit that's within the light of sight of, this, of, uh, of the track itself would be a concern. And so um, we'd look forward to getting together with um, the sound consultant and the designers for the proposal um, to be able to drop their design into our model and our master plan so that we could, you know, compare notes and see if, you know, what the trajectory is of that gap, where it lands on our project, and some mitigation strategies that we can use uh, to be effective there. Well, if, if, if 
if the fair board can assist with facilitating I, I hope I hope those conversations are able to happen soon uh, since you know y'all are forging ahead uh, you guys need to be you guys need to be engaged so thank thanks a lot for this presentation mr. Melton thank you for that update it's uh, it's neat seeing it all come together <laughs> um, uh, just quick reminder if you wouldn't mind explaining the mechanics of the workforce housing I, um, so is, is it just a certain number of units are set aside for a below rate unit or how does that work yeah, yes, that's right. When we're employing uh, low, low income housing tax credits and some other methods, uh, we'll be offering affordability for the 60% um, median income level and the 80% median income level, 60 or below, 80 or below. And that comprises about half of the unit makeup of our building. And so when, our, when a resident who qualifies for that type of housing um, comes to lease a unit, you know, they have their choice of, of units. They're all identical. They have access to all the amenities in the building. It's really just a matter of uh, filling out the application and then they're able to rent um, the unit and not be cost burdened is, is that uh, uh, any kind of preferential treatment to existing Davidson County residents or how, how does is there any other stipulations for that yeah there's nothing really like of that nature that that exists that I'm, I'm aware of but um, we've participated in these types of projects in other areas of Metro and um, it's going to be a very popular project um, you know we, we'd like to prioritize individuals that live nearby to this campus because um, you know that's really the population that we're trying to serve and that's what the market research really points to in terms of who's attracted to this location thank you Mr. Wiener, did you have okay one, one final question just uh, I think you said half and so in block C what's the current projection on on those below market rate units uh, in, in that building yes so the uh, total build out of the block C project will be 328 units 160 of those will be below market rate at 80 percent of median income or less thank you so much Eric. all right that concludes our meeting <laughs> Do we have a motion to adjourn? Oh, I have a question, yeah, a couple sure. questions. Um, since uh, we hadn't met in a while, it reminded me, after seeing some of these buildings, about our art project. I know you were the art representative, and I did not know where the art started and stopped. Uh, so I appreciate an update on that. Sure. I, I had actually reached out to um, the Arts Commission recently, and they indicated that they were working on the contract with the selected artist. Um, her name is Blessing Hancock. And as part of that process, Arts is working on a community involvement plan. Um, I, I believe the, those plans have not been finalized yet, but I know that they want to involve the community and what that art looks like. Um, and if you have not seen her work, um, Google it. it. There's a lot of light involved, which is uh, really fun to think about the type of project that we can have here. And just a reminder that there's two art projects, essentially two bits of funding. Um, one is that kind of main piece, which we've um, earmarked the little oval that's on the corner here of the courtyard for the main piece. And then a local artist functional art piece, um, which can be comprised of many pieces, but it's more functional art. It could be cool bike racks or benches or, you know, any type of, of um, functional amenity like that with an artistic lens. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I'll, I'll just take a point of personal privilege. I know uh, Councilman Sledge is here, but um, uh, that we've had another board uh, member being uh, nominated to serve and will be up for council. Um, and so I know that'll be uh, uh, coming up pretty soon, but I just wanted to share with at least Councilman Sledge, you know, reiterate uh, the board has uh, asked many times that for us to have a, uh, a Latinx uh, nom uh, member nominated to help tie into the uh, existing Owens Road community and that's not happened and, um, you know, we're, we're waiting to, to see that happen and I just hope you can reiterate, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for the entire board, but I just know that's been uh, a point of contention and a point of discussion uh, that we've had uh, over the last several months and while we're actually awaiting our fifth uh, board appointee, uh, we would love to see that happen as well. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? Motion we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. See you all next month.
This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.